Welcome to the Buck Hunters Cafe. Have a seat anywhere. Hi, Marta. Thanks. Hey, Bojan. Hi, Jason. Glad to see you arrive here at Traveling Closet. The front door is very dangerous at this moment. Uh, why? The squirrels are blockading the cafe. What? Why? Apparently, they all want free almond latas. Oh, boy. Yeah, Johanna said absolutely not. And now they are armed with pinecone uh, slingshots. Uh, well, I uh, hope this gets resolved soon. How is our, suppo- how is our uh, guest supposed to get in? April Wenzel, I already warned you to come uh, using the back door. Compassionate coding, that April Wenzel? That's her. She spent the past decade as a software engineer and technical leader in variety of fields. Healthcare, gaming, education, user research, and now she's an advocate for more socially responsible tech industry. That's great. Maybe she can negotiate with those squirrels. Oh, there she is now. Hi, April. Hi there. Glad I made it in. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hopefully didn't get too much trouble from the uh, rodent paramilitary outside. No, I managed to avoid them. You know, they're um, they're challenging my uh, my beliefs about squirrels. The other day I tweeted about how you can't nature's so calm because, you know, you, you can't be suspicious of a tree or a uh, accused squirrels of subversion i guess i was wrong there <laughs> yeah <laughs> gotta adapt I, that well true story and and in case anyone's thinking this is just made up this is an absolutely true story i will i would swear to this in a court of law i went at one place we were living we had these huge pine trees these like you know 30 40 foot pine trees and um went, went outside to go get the mail uh, minding my own business and this squirrel starts cursing at me from the treetops. And I'm just thinking nothing of it. I'm used to squirrels, you know, cussing at me. Anyway, and then a pine cone explodes behind me on the on the road. And there's another one whizzing by my head. And I'm realizing the squirrel is actually up in the treetops throwing pine cones at me. I am running. I'm ducking and covering like I'm in Saving Private Ryan. I am running for the front door. The pine cones are, are, are hitting the ground so hard they're shattering. And I, I, I get in the house, I slam the door shut, and you hear the pine cones smashing up against the door. Mom's like, what in the world? I said, the squirrels are out to get me. So like, what'd you do? I don't know. We had marks on that door from that day on from where the pine cones hit. <laughs> wow. I'm so surprised people don't believe that story. Why would they even question it? It's so real. <laughs> it's just, well, I'm a stand-up comedian too. So people think, well, you know, he, he makes this stuff up. He's got a good imagination. No, the squirrels really can be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so April, um, Maybe, maybe we should start up. I, I, I wanted to ask, Jean, why compassionate coding? Jason, your horrible what? host. April, what do you want to drink? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just looking at the menu here, and it looks like they have some vegan milkshakes. So I'm going to get a vegan chocolate milkshake here. Excellent. Uh, do you want some uh, rainbows with it? Oh, yes, please. I'll be right back. You'll be happy to know the coffee's on soft, terrific. They, they're the ones who pay for these talks. Nice. So, um, April, I, I think I kind of know the answer to this one, but I want to ask anyway. Why compassionate coding? Why compassionate coding? Well, um, you know, I spent about a decade in tech working as a software engineer, and uh, I guess I looked around and saw a lack of compassion. Um, And as I learned more about compassion and how it can be a rational thing uh, where you just look around and see, um, you know, where there is hurt, where there's pain, where there's suffering and try to alleviate it. And um, I thought, you know, this is something that that tech could use. And so um, part of me coming to that realization was actually in 2016, I went vegan. And so that whole thing for me is about compassion. It's about not wanting to cause harm and suffering in the world and trying to reduce the harm that you do cause. And so I thought I could apply this to the work that I do as a software engineer. And so I started writing about that and talking about that. And it seemed to resonate with people because many other people were feeling this uh, this lack of compassion um, in the industry. And so I I, I want to ask them because I'm, I think I'm even a little bit confused about something. So... Mm-hmm. I have two different friends, one of whom's been on the podcast. Um, 
Uh, Andrea Golay. I hope I'm not pronouncing oh, yeah. her name wrong. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's fantastic. And then um, Moshi Zadka, um, who mm-hmm. joined us for coffee um, a while back. And anyway, they seem to be making the same point, but they have a, a, a stark difference in their terminology. So Andrea coined the phrase empathy-driven development. Yes. And then Moshi emphasizes that empathy isn't so much important for DevOps as sympathy is. And I'm suspecting it's probably more a difference in vocabulary and language than it really is in concept. But maybe you can help disambiguate the concepts because I, I think they're both right, but they have different ways of expressing it. And before you answer that, here's your milkshake. Thank you. This is going to be great. Okay. So... Um, very good question. And a lot of things do come down to terminology. Um, so one way of looking at it, uh, the way I like to look at it between empathy and compassion is empathy is understanding what other people feel. And there's different types of empathy. Uh, there's like, you know, the actual feeling side of it. There's the more cognitive side of it. There's, it gets complicated, but just to keep it simple, empathy is understanding how people feel. Compassion is understanding and then when you see suffering wanting to actually take action to alleviate it so compassion is sort of a more active form of empathy uh in the way that a lot of researchers talk about it um and then sympathy is you know is also related where you look at um you know where there's pain where there's pain points that sort of thing and want to um you know alleviate it as well but that you may not sympathy uh may not actually uh, you may feel for them, but you might not feel feel the feeling they're feeling. You just can observe that they're they're hurting in some way. Now, of course, different people define it in different ways, and I think it's important to talk about like if you're having a conversation, oh, what do we mean by these words? But it gets to the point where people can just you know sort of define their own version of it. Like I think the original version of compassion, um, you know, if you look at its roots, is like to suffer with which you know, is not the same as what I just described. However, the term has evolved, right? And so that's the thing is these terms evolve and they change meaning. And so I think right now, the way, I think as long as you get on the same page uh, about what you're talking about, then you can have a productive conversation, right? So for the way I look at it, compassion is sort of like a act, more active form of empathy. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah. Because there's a book called, uh, I was thinking of a book uh, that's called uh, like Against Empathy or something like that. But ultimately, which, I, you know, I'm always interested in people that make, you know, arguments against things that I, that I like or that I care about. And uh, I think, you know, one of the thrusts of that book is that a more rational kind of compassion can be more useful because sometimes getting too emotionally involved in something can blind us to or can um, obscure some of the, uh, the issues with it. Um, and so can like make it hard to think clearly about it. So, yeah. So I think, um, hopefully that helps a little bit, or at least muddies the water a little bit more to show that, you know, sometimes these, uh, these concepts are, uh, fuzzier than we may think. Uh, I'm going to quote Dostoevsky here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, my Russian teacher is going to be very proud of me. Yes. Basically, you can say anything you want about human history, but one thing you cannot say is that uh, that it is irrational. And that goes same for every single person. If you try to look at uh, communication, education, programming, anything as a completely rational stuff, it's not going to work. You always Absolutely. have to account emotions into that picture. Absolutely. Very true. Yeah, I think um, that's thank you for pointing that out. Um, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, there's a quote by Karen Armstrong that I they quote all the time, which is that a um, lot like it's like reason without uh, if it's not tempered by empathy and compassion, reason can lead men and women into a moral void. And it's kind of like if you do try to like abstract out the emotion and abstract out feeling, you can end up like with really horrible conclusions. So emotions are, um, yeah. And I think a lot of harm comes from people thinking that they're acting perfectly rational. So when I talk about, you know, rational compassion, of course, there's going to be elements of emotion in it. It's more that, uh, you know, in, in a way we're trying to strive for, uh, looking at objective things as well, in addition to recognizing that we can never be fully objective. And so this is, it's an interesting nuance. That's why a lot of this stuff is uh, you know, like I said, it's kind of fuzzy because there's different extremes and, and the truth often lies somewhere in between. Well, I, it's kind of interesting, the timing on this, because I just had a conversation on LinkedIn that was rather frustrating <laughs> uh, because somebody somebody made the assertion. 
and I'll explain why this type of assertion really gets on my nerves. But someone made the assertion that you know you should you should be using pair programming instead of code review. Mm-hmm. I don't like the word instead anytime it comes with tooling, because it, it to me it's this sort of arrogant presumption that you know we understand how everybody works. And I tried mm-hmm. to explain that hey, I'm working with an asynchronous team. I'm working with a team that's distributed across the world. We use a lot of pair programming, but we also need code review. We use both. We benefit from both. And this person was making the strong assertion without any real instances to cite. Just, you know, he was just making the raw assertion itself that, well, code review never works. It's always bad. It's always wrong. You know, it never helps. And, of course, that's, that's, that's you know, we, we know that can't be the case because there's a lot of teams that regularly use it. But I was looking at how strongly he was reacting emotionally to this concept of code review and he couldn't seem to understand that other people use it successfully on a regular basis in fact he was the first person i've ever encountered to speak ill of code review as in principle there's bad ways to do it but you know in all the years i've been in tech no one's ever said well code review is all bad i've never heard that before and Yet he thought he was being completely objective and completely rational. And it just reminded me of the editor wars. You know, it's like Vim is better. No, Emacs is better. And they think they're being rational. Tabs versus spaces were being completely rational. In fact, it's almost entirely emotional. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, instead is a good word to look out for. Um, also, I, I believe in that quote you mentioned, um, should or shouldn't, something like that. You should be doing this. That's another one to look out for is should, because it's this way of like, pushing yeah what, what you think should ha- should happen on someone else uh, versus like trying to understand why are they doing it that way why would somebody uh, think that this way is better or that they would prefer this way um, for sure I mean I, I and 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 to be clear I, I think it's great to introduce people to additional tools and to help them learn how to use the tools that they have better but I think it's I think it's ideally, I think it's ideal to give people more tools rather than try to talk them out of using tools that they have, you know, give them other tools, show them other things that they can do, and then let them decide what works best for their team. Yeah, I find in those situations, it's helpful to use the first person, um, you know, and this is an idea that comes from nonviolent communication, but like, I like using X because of, you know, A, B, C reasons. Uh, and uh, then you leave it open where th- these are reasons you might want to try this tool, but it leaves it open for, oh, actually, I prefer using, you know, Y for, you know, D, E, F reasons. <laughs> and um, that way, you know, it just kind of like lets people be a little bit calmer and see things from other points of view. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's one question I want to ask is uh, how do you teach empathy? Because usually people assume you're either an empathic person or you're not. Like uh, that's set in stone. You cannot uh, learn that uh, sort of skill. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I, I immediately what comes to mind is the idea of the growth mindset from Carol Dweck. So she has this idea that a fixed mindset is things like that where you might say, oh, I'm just not an empathetic person or, you know, I'm just not creative or I'm not good at math or I'm not a technical person or whatever it is. And you're kind of putting yourself in a box, whereas a growth mindset opens up to the idea that if you practice at something, you can get good at it. You can improve on it. And so, um, you know, I think empathy is one of those things. Compassion is one of those things. It's just a skill that anybody can work on with practice. So with empathy, a lot of times it boils down to perspective taking. Um, So, you know, thinking about what somebody else is going through and, you know, reading about other people. There's studies that show that reading fiction books helps increase empathy because you get insight into how people think. (laughs) So Dostoevsky, you know, et cetera, uh, all good choices. Um, And, you know, especially if you read uh, fiction and works from people uh, from different backgrounds from you. Um, And you know, that can help develop, like, deepen your empathy. Um, and so there's there's ways to practice like that. There's empathetic listening where you, you know, instead of listening, waiting to get your point in and to um, confront somebody else, you listen to actually understand where they're coming from. Like, what's their model of the world that they think the way they do? And so that can come from just genuinely listening to the other person um, and not just waiting to get in your point. Uh, for me, uh, this is going to uh, sound very strange, but uh, the biggest help uh, in programming and learning how to 
transfer knowledge was uh, starting to learn French. Uh, because for some reason I managed to find uh, the best French teacher in the whole world. And I don't say that lightly. I don't uh, hear uh, sounds quite well because it sounds the same to me and I have trouble with pronunciation and I'm horrible at grammar. But uh, she is so empathetic uh, to my problems and she's always trying uh, another solution to see, okay, this, this didn't work for you, let's try uh, something else. And working with her, uh, I learned actually how you work with others. Uh, basically, you do not uh, accept something as uh, given. Uh, okay, this solution doesn't work, you are at fault. No. Uh, okay, let's try to find a solution that works. And always uh, taking that look uh, from another uh, point of view. That's something that very helped me. But in order to get there, I had to start doing something that I was very, very bad and learning from somebody who was very good and very empathetic at uh, all that. I was also thinking about, you know, for me, I try to surround myself with voices that, that are not like my own. Viewpoints that are not like my own. Um, I posted on my Twitter a while back that if, if you are not being regularly challenged by your social media feed, you're following the wrong people. Because I like to find people who... The, the one criteria I have for following somebody is if they are, well, I like to say a decent human being. The criteria for that in my mind is they they have an interest in learning how to contribute positively to their environment. You know, they're, they're not they're not looking to trample on other people for the sheer power trip of it. It's kind of the only criteria I have, you know, <laughs> And um, it's not hard to find those sorts of people if you look. You, you, can, you can find them. But I found that my social media feed has also gotten a lot less depressing as a result. It's more challenging. You know, I'm regularly encountering things that I, I, I'd never thought about before. Sometimes things I don't agree with, but that's okay. Because then I can understand more about someone else's worldview, someone else's culture. But it also becomes more positive because I think the, the problem when we wind up in an echo chamber... And I think this kind of explains some of the pushback we have in tech to this whole idea of inclusion and diversity and compassion um, is that when you're in an echo chamber, outrage becomes really, really, really easy to find. Um, because if the only people you're following are the people who think like you and then they post what they're frustrated about, then then they're kind of pushing, whether they mean to or not, they're pushing all of those buttons that set off your own outrage. Whereas when you're following other people, they talk about problems that maybe you've never experienced before. And so the, the, the reaction is different. It's, it's not that, I guess, almost sympathetic outrage, but it's, it's not that outrage. It's like, oh, yeah, I know what that's like, and that's horrible, and that's wrong, and, you know, it's just us against the world. But it becomes that empathetic, you know what, I know what it's like to be frustrated. I've never experienced that. I want to know more about that. But here's a problem that I've never heard of before. Here's a situation that... I want to understand better. And it, it changes the perspective from being part of the victim group to being part of the solution, I think. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so you've touched on <laughs> controversial things here. So I'm going to be, I'm going to try to navigate this, uh, this carefully myself. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's something that I feel very conflicted on personally, because on one hand, like, I think that I've had, I've even in the past, um, said similar things as well about, you know, following people from different, with different opinions and that sort of thing. Um, and I do that. And I do, I will say one thing is social media itself. And again, this is, uh, probably a result of the lack of compassion, like in tech itself and how we build these platforms, but you know, the limited character, um, uh, limit on Twitter and the immediacy of it. And the, the fact that it's public kind of encourages the ego sort of to take the, the, the lead there. And so a lot of the interactions that you see happening on Twitter are people in their fight or flight mode. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's one thing to consider. And so that's why like currently I've been a little bit stepping away from social media to, you know, read different viewpoints in like long form. So whether it's long essays or books, which I know does take more time, but I think 
it helps deepen that sort of empathy um, and see like where some of the pain is coming from. Um, but yeah, because a lot of times, you know, when people do lash out on, on social media, so to speak, like I'm sure that in the past I've done it um, in like, you know, moments of weakness or just human moments of, of really being hurt. Um, a lot of times the suffering there is so deep and it's hard to sometimes understand that if you haven't been through something similar. And so that's where empathy, there is a limit to our ability to empathize sometimes because we've never experienced something so horrible. So we can say, oh, well, I still wouldn't act like that, but do we really know that we wouldn't um, if we were in that horrible position? And so I think that there's like, there's a fine line there between, you know, on one hand, we could be accused of burying our heads in the sand if we just, you know, mute or block anyone that, you know, we think, oh, that, that person's, that's too far or whatever. If we do that constantly, we might put ourselves, we might end up still creating some sort of echo chamber, at least looking away from some of the pain that's there. On the other hand, if we just completely, constantly expose ourselves to all of these, um, you know, all of this animosity and um, outrage and all of that, then, you know, what does that Nietzsche quote? Like, you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. Like, you can start to you know, maybe that will affect how you go about the world and then you'll start. So I think that it's, again, like we're talking about, it's not an either or, there's like a balance, right? And so I think it's all up to each of us to, to strike that balance, but then also I think to reflect on it and like over time and think, am I just looking away from something that's hard or, you know what I mean? So it's, it's there's a balance. Yeah. Well, and I, I, sh I should add the people I follow coincidentally, rather, rather coincidentally turned out to be fairly, fairly positive people it's like when they you know everyone's it's 2020 2021 is is certainly not going to go down in our memories as being the highlight of anything no. but <laughs> um, um you know a lot of people are going through some very difficult things right now but in general I, I find a lot of the people i follow um you know the one unifying factor among them is that they're they're in general very very positive because they're interested in in being a positive which is why, why I mentioned that being a positive influence in 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 their in their environment, not just being an angry voice, and and I think I think that helps as well because I I keep hearing people talk about the trash can fire that is Twitter, and I know it can be that, but I don't personally experience that in my own feed because I have followed about three hundred fifty people who are generally not that negative, and they avoid a lot of the acrimony. Um, not because they don't, not because they can't cope with it, but because it's just not worth the emotional investment to be angry all the time. And, and so it, it's, it's allowed me to, to really develop a better understanding, I think, in those little vignettes. I mean, the same is true over on LinkedIn, honestly, which is much longer form and dev, which is really long form. Um, but you know, I, I think there's something to be said for, for for the longer form, like you said. But I think part of it is is also choosing to choosing to follow more positive people too. Yeah, it's interesting because when I hear that, I think that you know, some people will hear that. I think probably some listeners and think that, like I said, that there's this danger of um, kind of looking away because beneath anger, right? Like, what causes anger? Mm -hmm. Like, if you think about when you've been angry, like something hurts, like, you know, like, I think ultimately beneath any anger is some kind of hurt or suffering. Oh, yeah. Anger is so, always a secondary emotion. So bringing in compassion to it, it's like, I feel like some people, maybe the ones who are suffering the most or suffering, you know, most immediately or, or like most acutely or whatever it may be, may not be in the position where they can sort of transform their anger into what you're talking about, which is a more like solution oriented approach. Sometimes they're at the anger phase. And there may still be benefit from that, which again, like no one can tell you who to follow or whatever. But I'm just yeah. saying that for me personally, I've found that it, I try to strike that balance of sometimes looking at the most angry um, posts, maybe the ones just to, to find out, you know, what that suffering is there. And so I think there is some benefit to that. And I, will, I say this, you know, too, <laughs> having compassionate coding came out of anger. OK, so like I was angry at how. Um, I had been treated in the industry of how people around me had been treated about um, the things that the tech industry was doing about so many different things and um, things I had done. There was some self-directed anger. So I was very angry and I did a lot of work and reading and writing and all of this to process that and sort of transform it into compassionate coding. But so that's also given me compassion for people who are still really angry because I understand that. And there's a lot of 
power to that anger. One of, I think the most recent post I have up on my blog is um, on compassionate coding is about how, you know, compassion isn't about being nice. It's really not. It's about, and I talk about like the benefits of anger and how that can be a powerful force for change. Um, anyway, so I just want to give, there's some nuance there. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, and of course it's it's early in the morning for me, so um, I'm I'm not nuanced this time of day at all. So <laughs> fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. You need we need to order him another coffee. Can we get, the, get another coffee over here? Yeah, let's let's do that. Hi, Buck Hunters Cafe. Marta speaking. Absolutely. We're open 24-7 at buckhunters.cafe. You can also find us on Twitter, Dev, and Instagram as buckhunterscafe. Wait, this is one of the squirrels, isn't it? Look, we are a business. We can't just go handing our free product. You have what now? What do you mean if we want Jovana back? Okay, squirrels, this has gone too far. Don't make the unicorn mad. Why, yes, he did just magically apprehend one of your scouts. So let's talk prisoner exchange, squirrel. about debugging. Okay. So, how do you debug uh, problems that you don't even know you have? Usually, uh, we're talking about compassion and uh, programming. But the uh, thing is, uh, people who lack uh, compassion are not aware of that in the most cases. So, how do you debug uh, that sort of problems? Wow, that's a very, um, that almost feels like a cone or something. It's like, a, you know, very philosophical kind of thing to contemplate there. Um, like to, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around, doesn't make a noise. It's like, how do you debug something that you don't even know you have? Um, I think that's where having a community, other people in your life come in handy, right? Um, because it's true, like if, if you, we don't, we don't know what we don't know, that sort of thing. So if you have people to give you that kind of feedback, that you, people that you trust, people that care about you and ultimately have your best interest in mind, um, as far as like debugging um, things like a lack of compassion, I think having other people around helps. Uh, and, and actually, this also applies to the code, because if you think about it, uh, the bugs wouldn't be there usually if you knew they were there, right? So it takes feedback in the form maybe of a customer complaint, maybe of uh, you know, a, a framework or library giving you an alert that something's wrong uh, or somebody new joining the team and being like, hey, I found this weird thing, right? So usually even in that case, the feedback um, is what helps you know that there's something to be fixed there. So I notice you've worked in a lot of different fields of, um, of programming. Do you find that different, that these, these different, these different industries have a, um, that there's a lot of differences between them in terms of what it's like coding in that environment or, or, or does it, or is it largely similar? And I, I ask because I know there's a lot of people who are working like in one subspecialty or one branch of, of programming, like say in healthcare, and then they're looking at, well, I, I want to move over to say gaming, you know, mm -hmm. and it, sometimes it feels like a different world. Certainly the popular stacks are different, but how different are they? Yeah. So, um, you know, making the transition from industry to industry like that, there wasn't much, um, I mean, it wasn't like a, an insurmountable sort of thing. Uh, you, no matter which job you join, there are certain, um, there are certain like things you, you get to know about the context of, of uh, the norms in the industry, that specific industry, that sort of thing. In healthcare, there were like HIPAA uh, regulations and things we had to, uh, you know, uh, had to abide by rules about privacy, things like that, um, special guidelines. Uh, you know, in gaming, I will say there's different culture in these different industries a little bit. Like gaming, there's obviously like a little bit more of that, you know, fun, freewheeling kind of um, atmosphere. Uh, so that sort of thing might change. But as far as the actual uh, programming skills, I think, uh, 
as somebody who is programmed in a bunch of different languages and again, as you mentioned, a bunch of different industries, the core skills are ultimately the same. And I would say that they're not even necessarily programming skills. It's like problem solving. It's like attention to detail. Um, it's like persistence. I think persistence is one of the most important programming skills, you know, like being able to uh, work through to not give up as you are working through a really difficult, maybe to find a really difficult bug or something like that. Um, so, so yeah, I think a lot of the skills transfer. And that's why I'm not so hung up on what stacks people use or uh, when recruiters used to reach out to me, sometimes they wouldn't even say what the company does, but they're like, oh, but we use this, you know, hot new programming language. And I'm like, you know, that that's not enough to compel me to do it. Like, I want to know what I'm building and what it's going to do in the world. And so uh, I think the, the ultimate, the skills, like we can pick those up, you know, like I think when you have core programming skills, you can pick up any language, you can join any industry. And so it's really about finding out what you like, what you, what impact you want to have on the world. And, uh, and again, if you are in a situation where you just need a job to get by, which a lot of us end up being in, uh, yeah, you can program for that. And, and it can just be a job where you just go and program and that's fine too. So we always like to ask this question. What is the weirdest bug you've ever encountered or one of the weirdest? If you can't think of just one. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a tricky one. I feel like there's so many, so many bugs. Um, Weird. Okay. Well, actually, this one wasn't in code that I wrote, but it is a weird one. Um, so I was on an airplane flying a three-hour flight from, I think it was Tennessee to Utah. Um, and it was like getting near the end of the flight or whatever. And then I'm checking like how long it's going to be. And it says, you'll arrive at your destination in eight hours <laughs> on like the back of the seat kind of like thing. And I'm like, oh gosh, it's probably like a time zone bug or something like that. And so, but I, it was weird to me because it's like you're on an airplane and you kind of want to have trust in like what's going on. And like, obviously the software is different on the back, you know, on the back displays than it is, you know, hopefully running the plane. But <laughs> it's like, I just feel like there's the context. I was just like, oh my gosh. And it, it reminded me um, of Close to the Machine, this book by um, Ellen Ullman, where she says, you know, if people knew how software got written, they would never give money to a bank or fly on an airplane again. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's that's definitely had that moment. So yeah, that was a weird one. I always take pictures and screenshots of these bugs. So I have a picture of that and I'm like, hmm, this doesn't seem quite right. It's like that one of the airport terminal with the blue screen of death on it or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like not very encouraging there. Not <laughs> not building a lot of trust in the in this institution. Well, I, I, I guess it's just one more facet of, of, of compassion is compassion for the user. You know, we, we mm -hmm. you know, it's so, I hate the phrase, won't fix. And whenever I advise anyone on project management or DevOps, the first thing I tell them is go into your bug tracker and get rid of the won't fix tag right now. Mm -hmm. Because won't fix has this whole attitude of, look, we don't care. It's here, but we don't care. And that's not, of course, the message that you want to send. You know, there is the bug that can't be fixed uh, because it's really weird. I like to tag that as spooky. <laughs> you have the bug that well, the bug report that isn't actually a bug report at all, that it mm -hmm. turns out to just be a question of misunderstanding. Well, that's invalid. That's, that's not even a bug, so it's invalid at that point. You know, you can think of other names, but I hate won't fix because, you know, a user reports something and they say, hey, this this bug is coming up for me they are being emotionally vulnerable at that point in a way and saying look i'm having this problem and my workflow is being stopped because of this and it's easy as the developer to go oh that's an edge case you know who cares mm -hmm. uh I, that's just that's just work we don't want to have to put into it but to remember that it is important to somebody and mm -hmm. have that compassion for for that emotional component of bug reporting well said nothing to add to that <laughs> well said and yeah there are there are bug reports that you know it's a valid bug but we just can't fix it but there's got to be better ways <laughs> sure okay i have a different question what is the nicest bug you ever encountered some bug that uh turned out to be okay this is going to be a feature <laughs> oh that's a tricky one um because how often does that happen? I don't know. <laughs> Is that a common thing? Um, I really don't have one for that. I think, you know, I think that the only time I can think of is when there's like been a bug that's been in our backlog or whatever to fix. And then we end up just like deleting that whole component or something. And then it's like, oh, 
done. I think stuff like that, like that's, um, that's probably, probably falls in that category, I would say. Yeah. Nice bugs are super rare. Yeah, unfortunately. But maybe they all can be nice if we, you know, change our perspective on them because it's all a learning opportunity, right? So. Catching what catching the bug in and in, in a jar and, and gently releasing it into the wild is. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's I. When you first asked me to be on this, I said, you know, I'm vegan, so I can't hunt bugs. Um, but yes, catching and releasing them in the wild that that I can do. <laughs> <laughs> or else just nicely ask it to leave. <laughs> yes, please, please, yeah. Like, I don't. I wonder if that would work with these squirrels if we're really nice. Oh, maybe that's that's possible. I don't know why this is coming to mind. Did you see the? Did you think see the thing? It's been going around social media for about I feel like about six months now. Was the 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 toy the 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 wooden blocks and the shapes? where you have to fit it into, you know, the circle and the circle and the square and the square and then you have the triangle and the, and the arch and, and the guy doing the video is showing, putting them all in the square hole. I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and someone else said, did the, did, you know, someone else recorded, you know, the, the, the developer, you know, watching the QA as if it's watching Q and A and she's, you know, starting to like visibly fall apart emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> she's watching this. I, I I I feel that sometimes because it's just like you're you're watching the test run and you're going why how or it's just usually in my case usually it's the users it's like I'm just sitting there going why are they not getting this I wish they I wish they would get this and I I know it's it's I like how Wither Van Rossum put it I was asking him about about language design on one occasion and he said um, you know if the users aren't getting it don't think we need to document this better change the design. Yeah, absolutely. That's like that whole book, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. Like that's, that's you know, um, it's about like how developers don't really know how people think. And so like we, because, we, you know, the, the I guess the, the uh, what he puts forth there is that, uh, yeah, developers are so, so weird that we don't really understand people. And so we design these systems that real normal people, in air quotes, can't use. And then we get angry at them for not being able to use them. And there's something to that, I think. Um, you know, it's an old book, so, you know, things have been updated and terminology has changed and whatnot. But I think that watching user tests is one of the best ways to develop empathy for your users, like watching people actually use your software. Um, and so, like, what you're talking about is true. It can be frustrating, but it's also, like, that's how you know you're growing because something, it's it's kind of challenging to do. Well, and I, I think it's very interesting you just mentioned how the premise of that book was basically that programmers don't know how real people work. And I, I think that goes back to the whole problem we're talking about with compassionate coding is that it's like somewhere along the way, developers forgot they were real people. It's true. It's true. And it's like, and of course, that's painting with a broad brush, like what I you know, mentioned about the book, because yeah. some develop like that's also part of the problem, right, is that we have this idea that developers are like this weird stereotype or whatever, when really there's all kinds of developers. There's, you know, developers who... Um, you know, developers of all different types of, of groups, people with all sorts of interests. There's people who, you know, paint and also code. There's like, you know, all kinds of different um, people. So there's really no one type of developer, but still there's there's something to that, that if we do kind of put our humanity on a shelf, <laughs> um, that can uh, hurt us when it comes to actually developing software for human beings and with human beings and as a human being. So the takeaway from that then being when you design software, put away your software developer hat and start out as with your human, you know, as, as, as sort of designing it as a human first. And are these two different hats? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's fair. They don't necessarily have to be, although, although I, I think there is one slight difference. And that is that when we're in developer mode, we tend to think like, you know, we tend to think in Silicon and, uh, that's that's the that's the trouble is we well and I, I I guess I guess what it comes down to is is what Mitch Kapoor talked about in the, in in the um, software design manifesto um, which is a talk he gave um, eons ago um, is that we have to be intentional about designing software you know we, we, we get so itchy to start coding now and we don't stop and actually figure out what it is we're coding first and so the design winds up being a byproduct of whatever the whatever is the most expedient way to code the thing 
um, instead of the design coming first and then us figuring out how to implement that design with our code. Yeah, there's um, definitely weighing the, the values that you have and like, you know, for certain things, it's like, oh, we do need to get this out the door as fast as possible. But in other ways, maybe it's like, maybe what's more important is this experience for the user and maybe we should give that the time that it takes and slow down and be intentional about it like you're talking about. And it all comes down to, you know, priorities and the values of and what your goals are in building it. And um, there's like no one size fits all sort of thing in that either. Yeah. There's a question about, uh, I want to bring out about diversity. Usually uh, that's the stuff uh, as a community on whole we are working on improving. But uh, what they find out is that teams uh, are still not very diverse and the uh, software they produce uh, is usually uh, reflects that uh, in, in itself because it's made just for a specific group of people. I know when I work with some uh, established industries, they have their own set of rules and their own uh, language that they use uh, in design and everything. And when you look at the rest of the world, it's like completely separate, a separate plane of existence. So this is not actually a question, but statement. Uh, I think uh, that uh, diversity actually produces uh, much better uh, software and products uh, overall. I agree, and I think there's there's good studies to back that up. Oh, and the more we get machine learning into the deal, the, the more that's becoming apparent. Um, I, I did not, going back to that whole follow, you know, follow people different from you on social media um, thing, you know, I had not realized until the last few years just how um skewed machine learning data can actually be and it's not because the algorithms are you know inherently bad but it's that lack of diversity reflected itself in the sample sets and so um i was somewhat aware of this because i could always get the automated phone systems to respond to me but my mother has a really hard time getting them to understand her um probably because i have that deep kind of announcer's voice um, and, and so computers like that for some reason. Um, but there's the problems with like facial recognition, um, and the racial bias that shows up in that, or, um, AI being used for hiring and how it tends to favor, um, white males and that's not because anybody sat down and said let's make it favor white males but because the sample data sets reflected the previous hiring which was predominantly white male because of past issues with diversity in hiring and diversity in training so it biased the system and, and it's it's interesting the impacts that has computers are still just a very sophisticated pile of rocks through that, but we are not rocks and we can make uh, changes, small incremental changes that make everything better. Uh, you mentioned uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, in Europe, uh, it's quite different than uh, in USA because there's much more regulations around that. For example, you cannot use any ethnic uh, data uh, for model training. You can be penalized for that if you include any sort of ethnicity in your data for training. And there is a new uh, law coming out. It's not a law, it's a draft of law, uh, similar to GDPR, uh, that basically forbids uh, any sorts of social scoring, uh, uh, facial recognition without uh, valid purposes, uh, and also manipulative algorithms. And I'm really interested to see if that uh, passes by how social media is going to change because whole Twitter and whole social media is based on manip manipulative algorithms. These are big and complex issues for sure. Um, there's some, you know, there's a website I like called uh, All Tech is Human and they sort of like aggregate a bunch of different organizations and people and books about responsible tech. 
and they talk about how important it will be to have interdisciplinary approaches where you know we bring in experts on all of these things because a lot of times developers have sort of anointed themselves to be the experts and then just sort of like read a book on these complex social issues and they're like all right now it's you know i'm the expert in this um when really they're people who've dedicated you know their whole lives or their whole careers to uh some of these complex issues and so resolving them is going to take you know it's an all hands on deck sort of situation and so thankfully there are are a lot of people talking about this out there and i think it's it's good to bear in mind also because as developers we have a we just have this predilection in general I've, i found this to be fairly universal to trying to find problems to solve with the fancy shiny solution in front of us um and at the same time to thinking well i could solve this problem over here with with technology and so the, those two things paired together we sometimes don't don't realize all the implications of, of bringing technology into something. It's like, yes, you could have your refrigerator automatically order more milk when you run out, but what are all the implications of this feature? You know, and it's it's easy to lose sight of that, I think, because we also tend to not think about what what bugs could potentially show up. And um, you know, when when we have the, the these systems in place, like okay, look 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 at the Amazon Alexa. Um, and the fact that, um, they had problems for the longest time with children ordering expensive toys on Amazon without the child intending to, um, or even understanding what they were doing because all it took was a little girl saying, Amazon, get me a dollhouse. And next thing you know, there's a $200 dollhouse sitting in a box on the front doorstep and... <laughs> The child, the three-year-old, did not understand the implications of saying this to the computer. For all she knew, it was you know there was there was a the, a kind lady in there, and um, you know that someone could argue, well, you know, Amazon should have known known better. But hindsight's always twenty twenty, and I make no secret of the fact that I'm, I may be a critic of, of of Amazon in many regards. But that was just normal developer oversight in that case. You know, we, we made it convenient without thinking about what's the worst thing that can happen. So when the bug shows up, it has implications far beyond just, just uh, you know, a, an odd user experience. Yeah. Well, uh, to change the topic, April, what's your question for us? We've been asking you questions a uh, whole hour. Um, let's see. My question for you is, when's a time that you have changed your mind about something in your life or at work or whatever, and uh, what made you change your mind? Hmm. That's a very good question. It's not uh, silly, but it's going to sound silly. My whole life, I loved uh, fruit uh, ice creams. And all of my brothers, uh, they love uh, chocolate ice creams. And I always used to laugh at them because, like, why can't you love uh, blueberries and stuff like that? And then a uh, couple of years ago, I, no, I don't know why, I started liking chocolate ice creams more. And I had a bit of crisis of identity over that. It's true. I'm not joking around here. And then uh, that was the moment... Uh, after I collected myself, that I learned uh, not to judge anybody tastes. Uh, for me, uh, up until that point, I used to have like, okay, I'm more sophisticated than others. I understand better, and that that was the moment when I realized I'm just as stupid as everybody else, and I need to respect <laughs> other people more. So, yeah, for me, that was the chocolate ice cream moment. That's fantastic. Thank you. For me, I um, I had some very strongly held political views for a good portion of my life, and it's irrelevant which, which views those are. I had some very strongly held political views. And I, um, one year I actually set a New Year's resolution that I stuck to, by the grace of God, and that was that for an entire year I was not going to share my political opinion with anyone. But I was going to ask other people about theirs. I was going to ask questions. I was not going to disagree with them. I was not going to tell them what I thought. I was not going to critique them. I was just going to find out what they believed and why they believed it. And I talked to so many people that year 
it was an election year too. So there's a lot of people with strong views during an election year. And I came to realize that some people that I had historically villainized as being irrational and, you know, not having any idea what they were talking about actually had some very salient points that I had never thought about. And that they also didn't all agree with each other, that it wasn't just, you know, my group versus, you know, some massive conspiracy on the other side but that there was a lot more complexity to it. And the funny thing is, a lot of my political views pivoted. The core of what I believed did not change, but the expression of it certainly did. And my understanding of the opposing viewpoints, I gained a lot of respect for them. And I since have come to realize that I think one of the problems we have right now, the reason why people can't seem to bring up religion or politics or anything else controversial without it turning into a heated argument is because for the past hundred years, hundred plus years, we've been saying don't discuss religion or politics. That's, that's a mistake because the only way you can learn how to discuss those things with compassion, with empathy, with care is to have the controversial discussion without the need to be right. And I think that applies to so many different things, even beyond the obvious stuff, you know, this is this this is what typically gets left out in the conversation about Vim versus Emacs. Um, is that opportunity to discuss someone else's views without having to challenge them, and being able to express our own views without hammering somebody with them, because that's what allows us to build bridges. And it's something I hadn't understood, but just by challenging myself to listen more, I learned a lot. Wow. Now that's powerful. That That's the kind of stuff, and I'm serious, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that might have the power to, to heal some of the fractures we have in our world right now. So thank you for sharing that. Well, I guess I guess as characteristic of these conversations, we start out going in to talk about debugging bugs, and we went to discussing about debugging society. <laughs> <laughs> it's all related. It's all connected. It is. Yeah, we don't solve uh, small problems around here. <laughs> no, we don't. But you know, I, I I guess I guess sometimes we as developers underestimate just how much power we actually have. We're problem solvers at the end of the day. Computers are just one of the tools yeah, we have. Yeah, and our hopefully arsenal. we can bring in more people <laughs> to to keep using that power for good. So um, we should probably do something about those squirrels outside. I don't know if they've 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 reached any uh, any any agreement. Do you want to help? Do you want to help negotiate with them, April? Because I, I'm getting concerned about the emotional tenure of the rodents. Yeah, I feel like we need to apply some of that compassion to, to hear to hear what they have going on there. Probably. Oh yeah. Do we have any helmets? Because I mean, I'm I'm all for compassion, but pine cones hurt. <laughs> Only armor you need is love. Go outside, Jason. Show them love. Well, I mean that that that's that's fair. But have you ever been hit with a pine cone? No, which is why I'm staying inside. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably be able to find some sort of helmet in the back. <laughs> what size helmet do you wear, April? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a small. Okay. All right. And uh, we can we can we can go deal with this while Boyan wears the armor of love underneath the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see how that works out. <laughs> April, uh, thank you very much for being here. You were a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a pleasure. Very, very deep, very moving conversation. Thank you for sharing everything with me. Thank you for, for sharing your experiences with us. And thank you for everything you do in the in the tech community. Likewise. Stay awesome. Now let's go talk with some squirrels. All right, let's do this. Bug Hunters Cafe. This is Marta. Yes, we are located online at bughunters.cafe and on Twitter, Dev, and Instagram as bughunterscafe. Uh, the music is provided by audionautics.com. We have a link on our website. The squirrel blockade? Don't worry about that. They are clearing out now. 
Oh, we were able to come to an understanding. We let them pay for their own lattes with unshelled nuts and they agree not to engage in further military action. Yes, negotiation really is a wonderful thing. Uh-huh, see you soon. Really, they're not so bad. I've had weirder days. Easy for you to say. You didn't have to negotiate a prisoner exchange with an army of rodents. I couldn't have made it out. They provided free pistachios, but thank you in any case. You want what now? Um, okay, but how do you provide change for a walnut?